G'day, and welcome to AOS Coach's sneak peek into the General's Handbook 2023. In this video, I'll highlight the season's battle pack, which we'll play for the next 12 months. It does include new realm rules, core battalions, grand strategies, battle tactics, as well as battle plans. Games Workshop sent me an early copy before it hits the shelves, however, they're not going to see this video before it goes live. If you would like to support the channel, consider purchasing your General's Handbook along with your other hobby supplies from my affiliate partners, Warpfire Minis in the USA and Element Games in the UK. The link is in the video description. If you're new to the Age of Sigmar General's Handbook series, the rules in this book will replace the prior General's Handbook rules like Galatian Champions or Galatian Veterans if you want to play in this new battle pack. You are welcome to play your old General's Handbook with friends. However, if you're going to play in a store event or a tournament, it is likely you'll be playing with this battle pack. So let's go explore the bitter lands of Antar. General's Handbook 2023 continues to be set in Gur, the Realm of Beasts. This year we'll move southwest through the Gurish heartlands from Galet to the bitter lands of Antar. Antar's snowbound landscapes are just as likely to take your breath away with their beauty as they are with their choking fog clouds. The continent is characterized by great stretches of snow-blasted barren tundra, dotted with frosted mountains and vast icy plains. The sheer cold isn't the only challenge faced by armies that strike out into Antar. As the continent is under siege by Bial, its neighbouring continent that seems to have fused itself with the Everwinter and is attempting to consume it. Luckily, the Kraken Sea separates the continents, though it is home to some of the most mutated Krakens known in the Gurish heartlands. The Realm of Beasts is saturated with amber magic, which is wild, hungering energy that drives the land masses to swallow up travellers and encroach upon each other's territory. However, in the awake of Alariel's right of life, a new arcane threat has arisen from the earth. Antor is rife with incarnate sightings, manifestations of the continent given sentience and form that stalk ancient landmarks. Wizards and shamans have found unexpected potential in the restless incarnates, and have been sent by every major power to track them down in the hopes of using them as an ultimate divining rod. Those wizards skilled enough to find an incarnate's arcane nexus may be rewarded with power beyond comprehension, assuming that they are skilled or simply bullheaded enough to avoid being swallowed up by it entirely. In Antor, there is only one cardinal rule, adapt or die. Let's bring the realm to life through the special realm rules while you're playing in Antor. Previous rules that you may have enjoyed, like your small heroes not being able to be targeted by shooting while it's in range of troops, was left behind in the previous General's Handbook, so I'll be free to shoot them off. This also means there is no Tunnel Master, nor is there the Bonds of Battle Battalion. What you will get this season is a Magic Focus Battle Pack. Wizard heroes with a wounds characteristic of 9 or less that are not unique will gain their Antorian Locus keyword. Examples of an Antorian Locust unit would include the Chaos Sorcerer Lord on foot, not the mounted version, the Gaunt Summoner, a Necromancer, a Mortis and Bone Shaper, the Fungoid Cave Shaman, a Warsong Revenant, and a Slan Star Master, just to name a few. At the start of the battle round, after priority is determined, the player that takes the second turn can pick one friendly hero on the battlefield. If that hero is an Antorian Locus, they can attempt to cast one extra spell and attempt to unbind one extra spell in that battle round. But if they are not an Antorian Locus, you will receive one command point that can only be spent to allow that hero to issue a command. This is a nice little bonus regardless if you are taking an Antorian Locus or not. Take a generic sub-commander wizard and you won't need to make the tough decision between casting Mystic Shield or choosing one of your great spells from your spell lore. Even your Blades of Corn, Sons of Ehemad and Beast Claw Raiders will get to benefit from this realm as they will get the extra CP. With that extra command point in the bank, I might use Heroic Willpower or Heroic Recovery more often or use that free CP to roll the dice more often on a rally or a redeploy. 
The real power from this realm comes from primal magic. At the start of the hero phase, both players roll a dice. For each 4 plus, each player receives one primal magic dice. After a player attempts to cast or unbind a spell, or after a player attempts to dispel an endless spell, they can roll one of their primal magic dice. If they do so, add the result to the casting, unbinding, or dispelling roll. That player can continue to roll additional primal magic dice until the caster suffers a primal miscast, we'll talk about it in a second, or there are no more primal magic dice to be rolled. Abilities that allow you to re-roll casting, unbinding, or dispelling rolls must be used before primal magic dice are rolled. If you choose to use an ability to re-roll a casting, unbinding, or dispelling roll, you cannot use primal magic dice to supplement that roll. At the end of each battle round, any primal magic dice that have not been used are lost. When a primal magic dice is rolled as a part of a casting roll, on an unmodified casting roll that includes a double one, the caster suffers a primal miscast instead of a miscast. The spell is not successfully cast, the caster suffers d3 plus 3 mortal wounds, and each other unit within 3 inches of the caster will suffer d3 mortal wounds. In addition, the caster can no longer attempt to cast any more spells in that phase. When a primal magic dice is rolled as a part of a casting roll, on an unmodified casting roll that includes a double 6, the spell is successfully cast and cannot be unbound. In addition, the caster cannot attempt to cast any more spells in that phase, and both players receive one primal magic dice. So there's a lot to unpack here. The primal magic dice is going to allow you to add one or more d6s to the result of a spell cast, a spell unbind, or an endless spell dispel attempt. If you've got a difficult spell like Mind Razor with a casting value of 8 that you really need to be successful to have a great turn, you could add d6 or more to the result through the primal dice. If you're on the other side and you've got that pain in the butt endless spell ruining your day, like the purple sun, the luminous rune of petrification, or the git spider wall, why not throw an extra d6 to get it rid of it? If you have an ability to re-roll your casting, dispelling, or unbinding, let's say Master of Magic Universal Command Trait, you will need to choose which one you use as you can't re-roll and use Primal Magic Dice in the same attempt. Be careful with those miscasts because not only will Primal Dice increase the likelihood of hitting a miscast, but it will also increase the damage suffered. Let me bust some mass hammer out on you for a second. If you roll 2d6, the likelihood of getting a miscast is just under a 3% probability. Add an extra dice and roll 3d6, and you're looking at around 7.5% chance. And then finally, if you jack up that number even more and roll 4d6, you are looking at about a 13% probability. If your general is an Antorian Locust, which we know is a wizard hero with a wounds characteristic of 9 or less that are not unique, they can choose one of the following command traits instead of the ones available to you in your battle tome or in the universal command traits. Shaman of the Chilled Land lets your general know all of the spells from the Lore of the Primal Frost. Spoiler, there's more than one spell in this general's handbook. Eye of the Blizzard, at the start of your hero phase, if this general is on the battlefield, roll a dice. On a 5+, plus, you gain one Primal Magic Dice. Chilled to the Bone, once per battle, if this general suffers a miscast or a Primal miscast, you can roll a dice. On a 3+, plus, this general ignores the effects of that miscast or Primal miscast. And finally, Eater of Magic, each time this general successfully unbinds a spell, roll a dice. On a 5+, plus, the caster no longer knows that spell and may not cast it again for the rest of the battle. If you have a multi-caster wizard, I don't mind the Shaman of the Chilled Lands, but it won't make sense yet because unlike previous General's Handbook, there is more than one realm spell. I the Blizzard also isn't too bad. On average, you'll get 1-2 to two extra Primal Magic Dice over the course of the game. Chill to the Bone is decent, but I guess it depends on if you're previously enjoyed Master of Magic. Now, obviously, you can't re-roll and add a Primal Dice, so you're going to be choosing one or the other. I'd probably like this more if it wasn't a once-per-game ability, or it wasn't a 3-plus to Shrug. 
Eater of Magic isn't a bad option if your general has multiple unbind attempts, and even better if they have a bonus to that unbinding. Ultimately, it's going to depend on your command trait options that are available to you in your battle tome, and when you do take a wizard general, if it stacks up against Master of Magic as well, or if you're better off outside of the general's handbook. You can pick one spell from the Lore of Primal Frost for each Entorian Locus in your army, instead of picking one spell from another spell lore that they know. Hoarfrost is a spell with a casting value of 8 and a range of 12. If successfully cast, pick one friendly unit that's wholly within range and visible to the caster. Pick one melee weapon profile on that unit's war scroll and roll a d3. Change the to hit, to wound, or rend characteristic of that melee weapon to match the result until the start of your next hero phase. For example, if the result was a 2, you could change either the to hit characteristic to a 2+, plus, the to wound characteristic to a 2+, plus, or the rend characteristic to be a minus 2. Now remember that an unmodified hit roll or a wound roll of a 1 always fails, so you can't use this to automatically hit or wound. Rupture is a spell with a casting value of 10 and a range of 18. If successfully cast, pick one predatory endless spell or an incarnate wholly within range and visible to the caster. The target immediately becomes wild and cannot be picked to be controlled or bonded for the rest of the battle. Finally is Merciless Blizzard, which is a casting value of 12 and a range of 12 inches. If successfully cast, pick one enemy unit that's within range and visible to the caster. That unit suffers 4d6 mortal wounds, that's right, 4d6 mortal wounds, but for each roll of a 1, the caster also suffers d3 mortal wounds that cannot be negated. The range of this spell cannot be modified and must be measured from the caster, even if the ability would allow you to measure it from somewhere else. If I'm ranking these spells in order of preference, I'm going Hoarfrost first, Merciless Blizzard second, and then Rupture third. I'm not a big fan of Rupture because we've seen a significant reduction of Incarnates on the table, and armies like Disciples of Zinch who are still taking the Incarnates will be hard to get this spell off. There are some predatory endless spells that I would have loved to have cast this spell on, but endless spells right now are relatively inconsistent. Now in a month or two's time, that may change completely, and we see through this magic-dominated meta, we see endless spells return in their former glory. But right now, I'm not a big fan of Rupture. Merciless Blizzard warms my heart with those 4d6 mortal wounds. On average, that's 14 mortal wounds, but for each one, your caster will suffer d3 mortal wounds that can't be negated. Oh, and it's a casting value of 12 and a range of 12 inches, so you better be putting those primal magic dice into the cast, and ideally with some native boost from your wizard. I fear seeing this spell in the hands of Disciples of Zinch with those Destiny dice, so just straight out use those double sixes to make this spell happen. Hoarfrost from this list is my favourite to cast, because it's easier to cast compared to the others, and it's a great boost to a melee threat in your list. Bring your 2 wound down to a 2 plus without using Finest Hour or a Triumph, or boost that rend on a high damage weapon to slice through armour. Again, it's going to depend on how many spellcasters you have in your army and what your other spell options are going to be within your battle tome. But all three have their place depending on how army lists evolve in this edition. But coach, my army doesn't have access to any wizards and I'm worried my poor little corn army is going to struggle in this edition. Well, little Scarbrand, I have some good news for you. You have access to Nullstone Adornments. A Nullstone Adornment is a unique enhancement that can be only taken in an army that does not include any wizards or doesn't have any units with the ability that would allow them to cast a spell in the same manner as a wizard. You can always take one Nullstone Adornment enhancement in such an army. Each time you take a Nullstone Adornment enhancement, you can pick one Nullstone Adornment from the table below and give it to one hero in your army that doesn't have an artifact of power. If a rule in your army allows you to take an extra enhancement, like the Warlord Battalion for example, you could take a Nullstone Adornment enhancement as that extra enhancement. 
But if you do so, you cannot pick the same Nullstone Adornment from the table below more than once. And you also can't give a Nullstone Adornment to a hero that already has a Nullstone Adornment or a Artifact of Power. There are three Nullstone Adornments. Polished Nullstone Pebble, when this unit is picked to be the target of a spell or an ability of an Endless spell, you can roll a dice. On a 4+, plus, the caster must pick another unit within 3 inches of this unit and within range of that spell or the Endless spell's ability to be the target. If when picking another unit, there are no other units within 3 inches of this unit and within range, ignore the effects of that spell or the effects of that Endless spell's abilities on that unit. Pouch of Null Dust, once per battle, at the start of the hero phase, you can say that the bearer will use the Pouch of Null Dust. If you do so until the end of that phase, unmodified casting rolls that include a double one, a double two, or a double three are treated as a miscast, or if a primal magic dice was rolled as a part of the casting roll, it's a primal miscast. In addition, roll a dice for each Endless Spell on the battlefield. On a 5+, plus, that Endless Spell is dispelled. Finally, the handcrafted Nullstone Icon. The bearer can attempt to unbind one spell or attempt to dispel one Endless Spell in the enemy hero phase in the same manner as a wizard. Each time the bearer successfully unbinds a spell or dispels an Endless Spell using this ability, the bearer can attempt to unbind one additional spell in that phase. I imagine the number of armies taking advantage of the Nullstone Adornments are going to be low because they're not going to have any wizards in their army or the ability to allow them to cast spells in the same manner as a wizard. Sons of Behemoth, Blades of Corn, Beast Claw Raider Ogres, the Fire Slayers and Caradron Overlords are just a few armies that I could see using these rules, although for most of them it means they wouldn't be able to use Arcane Tome if that was an artifact that they like to choose. Obviously, you can build any list without taking a wizard, or you could ally in a wizard if your army doesn't have a native one. Don't at me, corn players. Next up, we have the two core battalions for match play, Antorian Acolytes and Wizard Finders of Antor. Like in previous General's Handbooks, these core battalions can only be chosen once in your army, but you can choose other universal battalions like Warlord or Battle Regiment. You just can't choose double Wizard Finders of Antor, for example. The three icons you're seeing here on the screen is Champion, Infantry, and Monster. Champion is a hero with a wounds characteristic of less than 10, does not have a mount, and isn't unique. Infantry are units with a wounds characteristic of 4 or less, they're not leaders, they're not artilleries, they're not behemoths, and they're not on a mount. Notice that there is no mention of battle line. Finally, the monsters are behemoths that are not leaders. Antorian Acolyte is a battalion that requires two champion units and has the option to include one more champion unit. The benefit here is at the start of the hero phase, if there are two or more friendly Antorian Locust units in this battalion on the battlefield, roll a dice. On a 3+, plus, you gain one Primal Magic dice. If you want to play with Primal Magic dice and generate higher spell casts, this is the battalion for you. I'd probably fill the battalion with three of those champions to make sure that my battalion isn't defunct the minute I lose an Antorian Locust champion. This battalion is going to help you compete against those stronger magic armies like Zinch, Lumineth, and Seraphon if you have an important spell you need to cast. I don't even want to think about this battalion in their hands. So while you are generating extra primal magic dice on a 3+, the battalion does allow you to roll in both hero phases. So with some luck, you could have 4 or 5 primal magic dice, or you could double down even more if you took the Eye of the Blizzard command trait. The other battalion is Wizard Finders of Antor. This battalion requires one champion unit, one infantry unit, and has the option to include an extra infantry unit as well as a monster unit. The benefits to the Wizard Finders of Antor is each time a unit from this battalion is picked to fight, you can say that it will go on a wizard hunt. If you do so, pick one melee weapon profile on this unit's war scroll. Until the end of that phase, add 1 to the attack characteristic of that melee weapon, 
but all of the attacks that unit makes in that phase must target an enemy wizard. And no, wizards cannot be included in this battalion. You need to remember that it's often hard to get to these enemy wizards in melee. They're often protected by layers of screens unless they're an offensive monster hero like Archeon, a vampire lord on Zombie Dragon, a Keeper of Secrets, Krondus, or even the Glotkin. If you're taking this battalion to handle these key wizard threats, you'll want to make sure that you have access to high rend, because as soon as they see you coming, they're going to be able to save stack with Mystic Shield, All at Defense, and the Finest Hour. Now that's not to say that there isn't a benefit to this battalion, but it's going to come from specific factions. Fire Slayers, Slaves to Darkness building into Chosen, Saurus Focus Seraphon, and Witch Elf Focus Daughters of Cain armies are just a few that I could think of that could benefit from this battalion. There are six grand strategies to choose from, and they are all brand new. See you later, take what's theirs. Control the Nexus when the battle ends. You complete this grand strategy if two or more friendly wizard units are wholly within six inches of the center of the battlefield. Spellcasting Savant when the battle ends. You complete this grand strategy if the model picked to be your general is an Antorian Locus and that unit has not been slain. Slaughter of Sorcery when the battle ends. You complete this grand strategy if there are no wizard units on the battlefield. Baron Ice Scapes when the battle ends, you complete this grand strategy if all enemy units that have artifacts of power are destroyed and there are no enemy units within 6 inches of the center of the battlefield. Overshadow when the battle ends, you complete the grand strategy if all enemy battle line units from your opponent's starting army are destroyed and there is at least one friendly battle line unit from your starting army on the battlefield. Finally, Magic Made Manifest when the battle ends. You complete this grand strategy if there are two or more endless spells or incarnates on the battlefield that are controlled by or bonded to friendly units. So which ones do I like, assuming I don't have any good grand strategies in my battle tome? Initially, I'm drawn to either Slaughter of Sorcery or Overshadow from this list. I'm going to have to clear my opponent's battle line to score objectives and clear those screens protecting wizards, so it makes a lot of sense to choose Overshadow, although it does mean I might have to clear out a horde of zombies, a whole bunch of squigs, maybe even chew through durable fire slayers or pink horrors that could make this really difficult to select at a tournament. Slaughter of Sorcery is an interesting one because if my opponent is corn, I've automatically scored my grand strategy. But alternatively, if I face Seraphon, Zinch, or Lumineth, and they have a million wizards I have to deal with, I don't know if I want to chew through all of that at a tournament. I could try to shoot them off if I've got a lot of shooting in my army, but I'm now going to deal with Lookout Sir. If the meta shifts towards a lot of Anturian Locusts, I think this could be a good grand strategy to choose from if you don't have many good options in your battle tome, but if it does swing to god tier wizard heroes, it will depend on how you can project your power. Chewing through a unit of Horrors of Zinch to get into that Lord of Change without great ranged offense isn't easy. There is a lot of references to incarnates in this book, both in the lore and the rules, which makes me wonder if we're going to see another incarnate released in this season. Right now, I wouldn't take Magic Made Manifest with an incarnate. Look, if you're taking an incarnate plus three endless spells, you've definitely increased your likelihood of scoring this particular grand strategy. The likelihood of the incarnate surviving the full game is quite well medium to low it depends on again who you're fighting against and how much experience they've had against an incarnate you obviously want to tie into more of the endless spells if you're going to take this particular one but this one right now is a little fickle to me Spellcasting Savant is an interesting selection if you're going to play with something like Sylvaneth with the Warsong Revenant slinging spells through the Wildwoods or even a Slan Star Master General in Seraphon the others are situational depending on your army and your build style. Again, this also comes down to which grand strategies you have in your battle tome. Disciples of Zinch are not giving up Master of Destiny, and neither are Daughters of Cain with the Bloodthirsty Zealots. 
There are eight generals handbook battle tactics and all of them are brand new. So bye bye gaining momentum, eye for an eye and desecrate their lands. Obviously you can use these eight generals handbook battle tactics along with your faction ones. Intimidate the invaders. You complete this battle tactic at the end of your turn. If there are more friendly units wholly outside your territory, then there are friendly units within your territory. Reprisal, you complete this battle tactic if an enemy unit that destroyed a friendly general earlier in the battle is destroyed in this turn. Endless expropriation, pick one enemy unit that is controlling or bonded to an endless spell or incarnate. You complete this battle tactic at the end of your turn if any of the following are true. That enemy unit has been destroyed. That endless spell is wild. That endless spell is controlled by or bonded to a friendly unit. Or that incarnate is wild. Magical dominance. You complete this battle tactic at the end of your turn if a friendly wizard unit successfully casts one or more spell and none of the spells cast by any units in your army were unbound. Magical Mayhem, pick one enemy unit on the battlefield. You complete this battle tactic if that unit is destroyed by damage inflicted by a spell or the abilities of an endless spell. Bait and Trap, you complete this battle tactic if two or more friendly units retreated this turn and two or more different friendly units made a charge move this turn. Lead into the Maelstrom, you complete this battle tactic if one or more friendly heroes and one or more friendly battle line units each made a charge move this turn, and at least one of those units are within three inches of an enemy unit at the end of the turn. Finally, surrounded and destroyed, pick three different friendly units on the battlefield. You complete this battle tactic at the end of your turn if each of those units are wholly within six inches of a different edge and two or more of those units are wholly outside your territory. So when you take a step back, you start to see some emerging themes come up. Bait and trap and lead into the maelstrom all involve charging into your enemy. Surrounded and destroyed and intimidating the invaders all involve board positioning and will favor armies with movement shenanigans. Endless expropriation, magical dominance, and magical mayhem are all involving wizards, spells, or endless spells. And reprisal is just a much harder version of eye for an eye. I really don't want my general to die just to activate a battle tactic, but it's nice to have if it happens. Magical dominance might be our most common turn 1 battle tactic, especially if you're taking the top of turn 1 and there's not a lot of things in range of unbinding and casting. Just deploy your wizard outside of unbinding range, look for some arcane terrain, throw a primal magic dice if you're not feeling confident, just go for a mystic shield, end it there when you're successful, score your battle tactic. Unless you've got a really good turn 1 battle tactic that's sitting in your battle tome. Finally, there are 12 new battle plans with a wide variety of deployment zones, number of objectives, and special rules. Some of the battle plans are absolutely wild, but with some testing, I'm sure we will settle on those 5 to 7 battle plans that will be frequently used on the tournament scene. Now, I'm not going to go through every battle plan in this video, but I'm going to call out some of the more interesting setups and rules. In lines of communication, at the start of each battle round, after determining which player will take the first turn, the player taking the second turn can pick one phase to disrupt. An example of this would be the hero phase. During that battle round, each time a model in their opponent's army issues a command in that phase, their opponent must roll a dice. On a 3+, an additional command point must be spent in order to issue that command. Their opponent can choose whether or not to spend an additional command point. If they choose not to spend the additional command point, that command is not received, the command ability is still count as being issued, and the command point that was used to issue that command is lost. In the ice fields, each time a unit runs, it suffers d3 mortal wounds. Also, when you make a charge roll for a unit, for each dice that shows a 1 before modifiers are applied, that unit suffers d3 mortal wounds. The last battle plan I'll show you is Spring the Trap. 
During deployment, after both players have set up their units, starting with the attacker, each player can remove D3 units from the battlefield, just roll once for both players, and then set up those units in reserve. Starting from the second battle round, at the end of your movement phase, you can set up those units that you placed in reserve, wholly within 6 inches of a battlefield edge, and more than 9 inches from all enemy units. There has been some changes to the Universal Endless Spells. Not all of them, but some of them have changed. I'm going to call out my top 5 Endless Spell changes. With Chronomatic Cogs, if you decrease the flow of time, you can attempt to cast either Arcane Bolt or Mystic Shield in your hero phase with a friendly wizard wholly within 6 inches of this Endless Spell, without counting that spell towards the number of spells that that wizard can attempt to cast in that phase. In addition, subtract 1 from hit rolls for shooting attacks that target wizard heroes while they're wholly within 6 inches of this Endless Spell. It's worth calling out that if you've already cast Arcane Bolt or Mystic Shield earlier in that phase, the Endless Spell is not going to allow you to attempt to cast Arcane Bolt or Mystic Shield again in that phase. Speeding up the Chronomatic Cogs is still the same, and that's why I haven't got all of the rules here, but the big change is coming down to when you slow down time, because you can no longer re-roll those casting rolls. Launching the Soul Seeker has had a change with Soul Pike. Before the commanding player moves this endless spell, they can pick one friendly wizard with a wounds characteristic of 9 or less, wholly within 3 inches of this endless spell. It does sound a lot like the old rules, except it wasn't previously locked to a wizard with a wounds characteristic of 9 or less. So it looks like Thankwool won't be hitching a ride with this Uber driver and will need to teleport using the Gnar Holes. This is a big change because when you teleport through a Gnar Hole, it counts as your movement, but through launching the Soul Seeker, you still get to move, so you can be outside of 9 inches of an enemy, make that move, and then burn an 8. Now that is no longer an option. Soul Snare Shackles has had a little bit of a redesign. Now at the start of the movement phase, roll a dice for each unit within 6 inches of this Endless Spell. Subtract the roll from the unit's movement characteristic to a minimum of 0 until the end of that phase. In addition, if a unit's movement characteristic is reduced to 0 by this ability, now that unit suffers D3 mortal wounds. It's a very interesting change and one to reconsider for wizards who are looking to slow down their opponent as they advance into their chaff screens or just to clog up the board. Umbral Spell Portal's Arcane Passage. Once per turn, when a wizard within one inch of this endless spell attempts to cast a spell, the commanding player can say that this spell will be sent through the portal. Now if they do so, the range, visibility, and effect of that spell can be measured from one part of this endless spell instead of the caster. And that part of the endless spell is considered to be the caster of the spell for the purposes of unbinding. There is some language change here, for example in the old one it was triggered off a successful cast, now when you make a cast you can choose if it goes through the portal, but also the endless spell is now treated as the point for unbinding purposes. The last endless spell change I'll call out is the Burning's Head's Flaming Skull. After this endless spell has moved, the commanding player can pick one enemy unit within one inch of this endless spell and roll a dice. On a 2+, plus, this Endless Spell is treated as a part of that enemy's unit until either that unit is destroyed or the Endless Spell is dispelled, and at which point the Endless Spell is removed from play. While this Endless Spell is a part of a unit, at the end of each movement phase, roll a dice. On a 2+, plus, the unit that this Endless Spell is a part of will suffer D3 Mortal Wounds. So it's no longer just another Arcane Bolt. You attach it to an enemy unit, and if they don't dispel the Endless Spell, It'll continue to do damage at the end of each movement phase. I have a real sense of optimism and excitement after reading this General's Handbook. Maybe it's my love for magic or the creative inspiration that is flowing from the icy lands of Antor. Magic has been dialed up to 11 in this season, to a level that I probably haven't seen since the Storm of Magic in Warhammer Fantasy Battles, just minus the Arcane Fulcrums. 
Primal Magic Dice have the ability to help the average spellcaster to significantly improve their success rate in their spellcasting, unbinding, and dispelling, while Magic Heavy lists are going to go to another level. While armies like Lumineth, Zinch, and Seraphon have the ability to go Hulkamania all over the Mortal Realms, we need to remember that there's also plenty of anti-magic available to counter this meta. Blades of Corn will auto-unbind spells with Blood Tie. Ossiarch Bone Reapers have the Null Myriad sub-faction that will shrug spells and endless spells on a 2+. Caradron Overlords will pop up into your wizard's face and start blasting with all their guns, as well as plenty of units in the game that have spell shrugs. Even if your army doesn't have access to the strongest wizards, you may want to still consider an Antorian Locus. I've been recently playing with Stormcast Eternals, and while we don't have the best magic in our million War Scroll Battle Tome, I do have a Wizard Dragon Krondus to consider, but I've also got plenty of anti magic options like in Cities of Sigmar, I've got a Rune Lord who could give me plus two to unbinding and dispelling, a Knight in Cantor for a once per game nope, or Darilia Vendence whose crossbow shot deals double damage to wizards. With the focus on wizards, we may see a return of popularity to endless spells to help those wizards project power. Things like Quicksilver Swords, Purple Sun, uh, Gnashing Jaws, just to name a few. There's plenty of offensive endless spells, even if your faction doesn't have faction-specific endless spells. It's worth calling out that I think there are some interactions that will need to be clarified and errated, especially when it comes to the battle plans. Hopefully this happens quickly after the book hits the shelf, along with the battle scroll and the latest points adjustments. Now that we've had a general's handbook focused on monsters, battle lines, small heroes, and now wizards, I wonder if the next one is going to be about artillery or cavalry. Who knows? But that's enough from me. I want to hear from you in the comments section. What are you thinking? Which army are you thinking about playing in the current season? And how have these new rules changed your faction? Has it impacted your list design? Are you now thinking about wizards? Are you going to go anti-wizards? Or are you just not going to care and you're going to do what you've always done because that's how you like it? Either way, let me know in the comments section. I'd be curious to hear from you. And if you do want to help the channel, considering purchasing your General's Handbook from our affiliate partners, Warpfire Minis in the USA and Element Games in the UK. Again, link is in the episode description. And I hope you enjoyed that preview into General's Handbook 2023. Thanks for hanging around until the end. I hope you enjoyed that video and you walked away with a few new ideas. Now, if you did, I would love it if you pressed like on the video, as well as left me a comment with your thoughts. The conversation will continue over on Discord and the link is down below in the episode description. I also want to give a massive shout out to the AOS Coach patrons and YouTube members who are supporting the channel and the growth that you're seeing here. So cheers, you are all bloody legends. And until next time, don't roll a double one on a spell cast.